Stage two of the Dauphiné, and at least on paper, it looked pretty much similar to day one. Out of the back door, we were climbing once again on lumpy terrain with virtually no flat. Plenty of climbs along the way, slightly higher categorization on this day. Altitude gain just shy of 3,000 meters. Again, a circuit, this time 35 kilometers in length. Two full laps laying ahead of the peloton. Well, would it be too much for the sprinters? Everyone's been speaking about Tuesday and stage three being their kind of day, but fast men had some ambitions on this one as well. Chris Laporte, who'd successfully won the opening stage, spoiling the yellow jersey, and time for a breakaway to have a dig. But they were never allowed too much rope, I'm afraid, out there. Kenny Ellison was only 45 seconds down at the start of the day. Donovan Grandin decided to get more mountains points. Judy took the first Category 3 tests, two of them along the way. He says in the polka dot jersey, but just about crawled home after suffering cramp on the day. Our breakaway were indeed extraordinarily brave. Once it finally fractured, Victor Campanats and Kenny Elisond were the last duo remaining. The gap narrowed occasionally and then stretched out to around about the half minute mark, but ultimately they were to be caught. The circuit, well, preview of the climb did not diminish the ambitions of a few and they were striking out. Austrian Tobias Bayer decided to go for it for Alpecin to Koenig. He pushed on, but really just over the peak there was yet more climbing to come on the rolling terrain that characterised this day. Even 5% around about the Flamme Rouge was going to put paid to the ambitions surely of plenty of the fast men. Well, they were up there. Sam Bennett certainly was in a position. Gronewegen had been found out, I'm afraid, on the final climb. It was always going to be a tough day. Nearly four hours in the saddle. By the time we were underneath the Flamme Rouge, we still did not know who was going to come to the fore. Some surprises as the fast men started to diminish. Laporte was in the frame, left it just a little bit too late by his own admission. The man who lit this up late was Richard Carapaz, but on his wheel, Julian Alaphilippe. The former double world champion drifting to the centre of the road. Would he have enough to hold on? The answer was yes. Alaphilippe delivering fabulously so. What a day it turned out to be. Tisfazion also getting an extraordinarily good finish for Trek Segafredo, proving that this was a day for the tough guys. Alaphilippe taking it ahead of Carapaz, Tesfatsion. Laporte finishing fourth stays in the yellow jersey. Van Hills standard Fred Wright was in there. Only likewise. It's a tough man's game cycling and you always have to take the bruises that come along with it. Alaphilippe has had more than enough of his fair share of disappointments. Well, physically, he seems absolutely back to his best. He came into this race looking for a stage win. And now on stage two, he has got it. He shares the time with the leader Laporte. Calm down, everyone. I am back. Where did he finish? Absolutely. Number one. Brilliant. Alaphilippe. Well, there could be other stages that suit him very, very well during this Dauphiné. Let's see how he copes with the time trial and indeed beyond. Laporte leads the race, same time as Alaphilippe, leading on count back Laporte, courtesy of the finishing positions he has had. Tomorrow, our destination is Costeur and the longest stage of this Dauphiné. The third stage, 194 kilometres in total. This was the day that was badged up to be one for the sprinters. And when you look at the parkour, you kind of believe it. So we look forward to sprinting and then, of course, time trialling and how this race will finally be sorted out. It remains a mystery, but it also remains royally entertaining. We'll see you tomorrow.